Cari Fratelli Sorelli and welcome to my weekly video blog. There is going to be major announcements next week, so uh, look out for that. Um, all I can say is that this, this week's blog is a bit different. It is a getting to know me blog, uh, but what I want to say, I've sort of said before in the Living and Learning series, so when I finish talking here, you're going to see a number of clips that describe uh, my Annus Horribilis. My Annus Horribilis is uh, my terrible year, uh, and that was in 2003, whereas my Annus Mirabilis was my brilliant year, and that was in 2008. Now, I spoke about that before because that was the turning point of, of one of the seasons, and you'll note that these years are, are exempt if you like. They, they fall in seasons but are not necessarily sort of seasons themselves. They're also not portions like the, uh, the Great Questionings. They are a name given to, you know, uh, a, a calendar year almost that were either the best I've ever had or the worst I've ever had. And the best we've already heard about. So um, now we're going to hear the worst and then after that I think we'll do the birthdays. What happened ten years ago uh, today was possibly the worst mistake I've ever made, the worst day of my life, you might like to say. My father has a phrase, he says there's uh, a moment's indiscretion that a lifetime of prudence cannot erase, and if ever that, uh, that saying is more applicable to a circumstance, it's what happened with me on April the 8th in 2003, uh, exactly ten years ago. Now, when I saw the child psychologist, uh, she said something interesting. She said, the problem is, she said, you um, live a very reserved life um, and there is a side of you which is not reserved at all and which gets repressed. A sort of dangerous side, if you like, a side that not many people see of me today, in fact. Um, and that side uh, sort of wants to get out. Um, and one can only live a repressed life for so long. But she said, do not worry, because there are exercises and there are things that we can do which will channel that urge and uh, stop it from building up to the, the state where it becomes something that you have to respond to. And they talked in this letter about the possibility of me having um, an anxiety disorder. And at the bottom it said very clearly, this possible diagnosis was not told to the patient. And it wasn't, we had no idea. In some ways, I do wish they had told me, because that might have solved some of the problems um, later on. The, uh, the 8th of August, sorry, the 8th of April even, um, my parents and my sisters had all gone out, and I was minding my own business, and I was watching the television, I was watching one of the music channels, and I don't know what happened, and, you know, uh, the urge that I had had uh, returned. And, you know, I went through with ritual, <laughs> as I suppose I needed to, but you have to remember that it was a ritual that I hadn't practiced in the best part of five years. I was out of practice, and it's an extremely dangerous thing to do. Um, and for the first time ever, I made a slight <coughs> miscalculation and um, I blew all the blood vessels in and around my eyes, which absolutely petrified me. Um, and uh, so that happened about this time, ten years ago exactly, or more or less about eleven o'clock. Get a grip to get my feeling on life again. And I found this little place and I, I sat down here and as I sat down here I was very, very deep in thought. Um, about what had happened and about why it had happened, how it had happened and what I was supposed to do sort of from that point. 
and uh, as I was praying it began to rain and I don't know if you've ever seen what happens when you're next to a river and it rains. It rained quite heavily actually and basically the river turns into li little diamonds if that makes sense. The, the, the droplets of water on the air drop into the, the, the water and it all sort of glows. A couple of days later the symptoms of my um, anxiety disorder began um, and I went through a, a big, big learning curve which at that point was, I thought, well, that's, this can't really be an answer to prayer um, because it's just made things worse but ultimately things got a lot better. And basically uh, I remember feeling rather ill in the afternoon. I was a little bit sort of weak, I had a bit of a headache um, I sat down and I took some paracetamol and that made me feel a lot worse um, and then I, I went to bed and when I woke up I, I had all the symptoms. Now these symptoms uh, were not something that I had looked up online um, and created. They were <clears throat> something that my mind created. Um, they were not they were not biologically produced. There was no reason for them biologically. Um, there was no biological basis to their cause. They were what we call psychosomatism. Um, and so I started by uh, having um, a headache. And this headache was quite bad. And it was constant. And when I mean constant, I don't just mean, you know, constant for a, a day or two. I mean it was constant uh, between this time and about January um, of the year after. So it was about a ten month, nine month odd headache that went on. Um, on top of that I had visual distortions. Um, these ranged from um, not blurred vision exactly, so definitely not double vision, but um, slightly blurry vision to full scale looking at something that was absolutely still and seeing it move okay um, particularly things that were um, vibrating um, very very quickly and I could see that and of course that was one of the things that affected my balance um, I had absolute chronic dizziness uh, and I get, and again, this went on. This started um, about ten years ago, you know, today, not quite today, um, and it went on for the best part of nine months. Uh, those were the most extreme of the um, <clears throat> of the uh, the symptoms. There were other symptoms that that came and went, um, particularly uh, numbness in the extremities. That was pretty awful. Um, weakness, uh, the inability to walk in a straight line, um, tinnitus, uh, which is when you hear things in your ears that don't uh, that don't exist. It's sort of like a um, a, a high pitch sort of squeaking noise. Um, uh, that those those continued. They started um, on the twenty sixth of April um, two thousand and three. And they went on until around about January the 4th, uh, 2004. You will remember uh, that the symptoms of my anxiety disorder had come back. And uh, this time things were slightly different. For a start, uh, we had the, um, the clinical depression, which was starting up again. And that was mainly because I was thinking... Um, that I was never going to get rid of this because I had thought it at all, you know, sorted itself out over the summer um, and it had come back. There was also the case of the support network. You know, I had been at university when it had flared up uh, before and this time I was um, in the lay community and you would have thought that a Christian lay community would be a better place to be supported than, uh, you know, <laughs> a student hall. But that was absolutely untrue. As you know, the doctors had been telling me for a very long time that there was nothing wrong with me. 
Um, and the Doctor in uh, Harrogate uh, was the Doctor that I was still under. And the reason for that is that she had promised to get um, an MRI uh, scan sorted out. Not because she thought that there was anything wrong with me, okay, I want to make that quite clear. But in fact, to prove that there was nothing wrong. That was the whole idea. Now, I thought that there was possibly something wrong. I did think by now, um, with the return of the symptoms uh, in o October, I, I thought that there was, there was actually probably something wrong. And I had informed the cathedral authorities of that, the moment this, of course, did mean that I had to give up the prochlorperazine. Um, I wasn't convinced that that was even helping me <laughs> at, at that point in time. I hadn't been uh, thinking that since, of course, the return of the symptoms, because the whole point was that the prochlorperazine had sort of stopped that happening. Um, I went to him, and uh, he didn't diagnose the anxiety disorder, but he did diagnose... Um, clinical depression. Now the depression was probably worsened by the fact that I am affected by the seasons and it was, you know, December, <laughs> so I'm not going to be happy anyway really. Uh, not enough light, not enough sunlight for me, but the symptoms were making me depress, uh, depressed, so it was reactive depression. Um, the, the, the depression was not causing the symptoms at all, it was a, uh, a symptom and not even a symptom of the anxiety disorder. What happens is if you leave something long enough without it being diagnosed and treated, it starts to create further problems. So where I had one problem uh, in April of, the, of 2003, I now had two problems. And the one thing he could do, he told me, was treat the depression. So, with all that out of the way, let us quickly do the birthdays. We have a couple this week. We've got uh, Dwayne Shelton and Chris Weidman, both of whom are fighters. Uh, uh, we've also got uh, Amanda Swan, who I work with, uh, Tom Wilkinson, who I used to work with, uh, and Miriam Morell, who <clears throat> I knew from my time, oh, years ago in Lincoln. So all of those are enjoying their birthdays this week. <clears throat> so... Many happy returns to them, of course, and I hope they eat lots of cake uh, and, uh, and make merry, and I shall be back uh, next week.